What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. Once again, of course, not Starbucks Shanghai, like the mug says. And welcome to week two of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2021 Canadian Football League season. And let's bask, let's at the same time, bask in the fact that this league that we all love so much is back. And let's try to conveniently forget that week one actually happened from a betting perspective, unless you were somebody that just took all the underdogs and all the unders. Yes, the underdogs were three and one straight up and ran the table against the spread in week one, showing once again that it, there was absolutely no point to Vegas waiting as long as they waited to bring the lines out. They were wrong about all the favorites anyway. And that being the case, I was also very, very, very wrong in week one. Uh, it was a bloodbath for me in the results. Only one and three straight up in the four games. I only got Saskatchewan correct, missed the other three, and got absolutely everything wrong against the spread because I had grabbed all the favorites last week. So O oh, and four against the spread. I also only got one of the overs because I took everything over because I thought it's going to take the defenses a few weeks to adjust. Turns out it was the other way around and it was the offenses that in fact needed the adjustments. So yeah, it was a 2 and 10 opening week for your boy, which is very very bad. Those are those are just atrocious numbers. I don't know that I had had a week that bad maybe in the 2 years plus that I've been doing this. That might be my worst week that I've ever recorded. Luckily, that means there's nowhere to go but up heading into week two of this season. But the one area that I did do fairly well was in CFL Fantasy. So in the official Atlantic Schooners CFL Fantasy Football League, which now has 82 participants starting with 75 from last year. So thank you, everybody. And I know I'm, I'm responsible for at least a couple of those. I'm in 15th place right now out of 82. So it was a strong opening week. Brought in 87.7 points in week one, which once again has me in 15th place. My MVP from week one has to go to Edmonton running back James Wilder Jr. He touched the ball 24 times for 161 all-purpose yards, accounting for 25.1 fantasy points in CFL Fantasy. Strong opening week from James Wilder. I wish the rest of his team could say the same. So from that as our starting point, we're going to dive right into my lineup for week two. And obviously we're going to be leaning fairly heavily this week on the Calgary Stampeders like I leaned on Edmonton. We are going to stack Bo Levi Mitchell along with Kadeem Carey and Kamar Jordan for the Stampeders. James Wilder was my MVP. He's going right back into the lineup again this week. I'm also grabbing Alouette's rookie, Julian Grant. Now, he only had a couple of catches last year, but I like kind of the... The, the position that he's going to be in with the Alouettes should have that starting Canadian slot receiver position. We're also going to go with Shy Ross, who was involved in the offense last week. And we're going to grab the Argos defense as well. A cheap option on defense, but they performed last week against Calgary. Let's see if they can run it back a second time. That leads us right into our week two slate of games, which miraculously all have betting lines. Now, when I went to bed last night, three of these four games did not have betting lines. And I was once again going off on Twitter about the fact that Vegas are cowards. But I woke up this morning, every game has a line to it. So that is tremendous. In week two, Ottawa is on the bye, getting a break after their surprise win last week. I would consider it a surprise. This week, we got the Lions traveling to Calgary to take on the stand. Toronto is in Winnipeg to take on the Blue Bombers, battle of two teams who won last week. Montreal kicking off their season on the road in Edmonton, taking on the Elks. And Hamilton is in Saskatchewan, taking on the Riders. The home teams are all favorited one more time. Stamps are six and a half point favorites against BC. Winnipeg, six point favorites over Toronto. Edmonton, three and a half point favorites over Montreal. And Saskatchewan, a slim minus 1.5 favorite against Hamilton. Now, before I get to talking about these games specifically, I wanted to pause and answer a question that I think was being asked prior to the beginning of the season by people that are kind of haters of the CFL or people that just don't give the CFL the credit that I think it deserves from a fan engagement perspective. Does anybody really care that the CFL is coming back? Well, 
let me take you to Edmonton now via pictures from my good friend Morgan, who her and her boyfriend attended the Edmonton home opener. Of course, they didn't come up on the winning side of things, but check these pictures. These pictures were taken from various points during the game from their perspective. As you can see, they had pretty good seats, a little closer to one end zone than another, but it still had pretty good seats. And that building got full pretty quickly. And by the sounds of things, that building was loud as well. Anybody wondering whether or not the CFL was going to be able to grab its fans back after not playing for a full year? Question answered if you looked at these home teams. Now with that out of the way, let's kick things off with the first game of the week, the BC Lions traveling to Calgary to take on the Stampeders. Lions coming up on the losing end of things last week, so obviously a one-game losing streak. And this is the second straight road game for the Lions. Back-to-back -back roadies, if you've been watching my NFL show, you know it's a thing. Lions, of course, coming up on the short end of the stick last week in Saskatchewan against the Riders by a score of 33-29. to It certainly looked like it was going to be a massive blowout. They trailed 32-9 to at halftime. They staged a miraculous 20-1 to run in the second half, which almost covered up the weird quarterback shenanigans that BC was playing in this game where Riley was listed as the starter but didn't start the game but played eventually but then didn't finish the game all kinds of ridiculousness at the quarterback position they just needed one more they needed one more good thing to happen and they may have come up and made it a clean sweep for the underdogs last week Quarterback Nathan Rourke starts the game for the BC Lions. He's a national quarterback, Canadian quarterback. First Canadian quarterback, I think, to throw a touchdown, they said, in a number of years. I can't remember who the previous one was, but the first national quarterback to throw a touchdown in the league in a while. He played the whole first half and the final drive towards the end of the game. Only threw for 55%, only threw for a buck 94. He did throw two touchdowns, but also threw two picks. Kind of what you would expect from a backup quarterback who probably didn't know he was going to be starting. Um, Mike Riley, when he did come in and play the majority of the second half, played like Mike Riley. He completed 70% of his passes, threw for 203, threw a touchdown, did not throw a pick. Needless to say, this BC Lions quarterback situation is going to be the one to watch moving forward. We don't know if Mike Riley is good to go this week, especially where BC has to play the early game. They get less time for him to be ready. We know he's dealing with an arm problem, and that is obviously the one thing that you don't want your quarterback to be dealing with is problems with a throwing arm. It's important because, look, in this game, BC had five receivers that had at least four catches. When Mike Riley came in the game, he spread the football around and it was measurably different like look at the completion percentage goes up from 55 to 70 so it's a significant difference whether or not Mike Riley is the quarterback for BC on the other side you have the Calgary Stampeders they get to be the home team here once again Coming up on the losing side of things to open the season, dropping a three-point loss against the Toronto Argos 23-20 to in Week 1. I mean, they could not have gift-wrapped that game any better for a team they absolutely should have beaten. That was so, that was an immaculate, just that, that gift couldn't have been any prettier if they tried. And look, when I say they gift wrapped it, they gift wrapped it. They outran Toronto, what was it here, 101 to 56, basically doubled them up in terms of rushing on the ground. They clobbered them in time of possession, 35 to 25, 10 minute difference in time of possession. They allowed zero quarterback sacks the entire game and managed to lose. They were in the red zone five times in this game. They only came away with 17 points. That's not good enough. That's only, what, three, a little over three points per visit? That's not good enough. When Calgary gets in the red zone, you think touchdown. If it's not a touchdown, you lost points. You left points on the board. They also took six penalties on offense for 44 yards. No better way to stall offensive drives than take penalties and shoot yourself in the foot. 410 total yards against, and that included having 354 pass yards dropped on them by McLeod Bethel Thompson, had himself a heck of a game. The defense wasn't overly helpful, especially on first down. They gave up 12.8 yards per first down. That's giving up a first down per first down play. At the end of the episode, I'm going to give you the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to see who can answer it without Googling it. 
What was the last time, the last year, that the Calgary Stampeders lost their first two games to start the season? I'll give you a hint. They finished that season still with double-digit wins. They finished that season 10, 7, and 1. If you can answer that question without looking it up, put it in the comment section below. I'll answer it for you at the end of the video. I have to be on the stamps here at home. BC was just too inconsistent for me. Like they staged that massive comeback, yes, but I don't know who the quarterback is going to be. So I, I can't take BC to go into Calgary and win the game. Back-to-back -back road games, tough on anybody, especially after a loss. And Calgary should be angry. They should be angry coming into this game. So when you're facing a good team that's also angry about last week, However, I'm not taking Calgary against the spread. I'd have to lay six and a half points, not just on a team that lost last week, but a team that gift wrapped the game to a team that they absolutely should beat. The BC Lions also qualify as a team that Calgary absolutely should beat, especially in their own building. I just can't lay the six and a half points on them right now. BC, yeah, they looked terrible in the first half. They looked great in the second half. And that included the defense to go on that big run. So I just think six and a half points is too many here. Again, BC won against the spread in that game last week. I think the spread was five. So six and a half, I have to take the points here on the Lions. Uh, the offenses have to start figuring things out. I would think after now having a full game's worth of game action, you've got your practices you kind of know where you're lacking you can make adjustments i have to assume the offenses are going to have to start readjusting i'm going to take the over here on a relatively you know makeable number i'm going to go stamps 27 26 in this game which hits the over Let's go to Winnipeg now with the battle of the two or two of the winning teams from week one. The Toronto Argos traveling to Winnipeg, taking on the Bombers. Again, Toronto, another team that's facing back-to-back -back road games, having got the win in Calgary last week, 23-20. to And again, this was a virtuoso CFL quarterbacking performance from McLeod Bethel Thompson. Completed 70% of his passes, 354 through the air, two touchdowns, no picks, added 24 yards rushing on four carries. This is the CFL quarterback performance that you expect to see out of high-end CFL quarterbacks. Who could have said that MBT might just be a top five quarterback? Look, the Argos proved a lot of metrics that I trust kind of wrong in their game last week. It's very difficult to win when you get badly beaten in time of possession. People talk about time of possession like it's an overrated stat, but there's a, like you possess the ball to score points to win games. So when you badly get beaten on time of possession, which they did in that game, 35 to 25, it's not a good, it doesn't put you in an advantageous position to win. However, the Argos played very opportunistic defense on all levels. They recovered a fumble. They had an interception. I think they even forced a turnover on downs. So the defense was opportunistic. They made the plays when they needed to make them. I don't think that's going to be routine, but it is certainly something that can happen once in a blue moon happened for them last week. Again, Argos were monstrous on first down, 12.8 yards per play on first down, but I do need to see them clean up a couple of things. They generated three turnovers, but they also gave up three turnovers. You got to win those turnover battles if you want to win games consistently. They lucked out in the fact that, yes, they gave up three, but they also managed to generate three. That's not going to happen every week. They've also got to clean up the penalties, and this has been a routine thing for the Argos over the last few years. They took 12 penalties for 92 yards, including 7 for 61 on defense. So it, if it's defense that's going to win you some games this year, you can't be taking that kind of penalties. On Winnipeg's sideline, they had probably the most convincing win of week one, a 19 to six victory against Hamilton in Winnipeg. So they get to play their second straight home game. No Andrew Harris, no problem. Apparently the Bombers play some lockdown defense against a very good quarterback and elite offensive weapons and pounded the football. Brady Oliveira coming into the game and doing really his best like Andrew Harris, William Powell, William Stanbeck impression, pounding the ball, 22 carries, 126 yards rushing. They committed to running the football, and it really, really worked for them against that Hamilton defense. Winnipeg also had 33-plus minutes time of possession, control the football, control the game.
Uh, Zach Kalaros didn't have to be spectacular in that game. He just had to be efficient. He puts up a respectable 64% plus completion percentage, 217 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. He was careful with the football, did what he needed to do, put up the kind of performance that leads your team to a win. Also, Winnipeg, 10.2 yards per play on first down, so also very efficient on that down. Look, these were a pair of impressive outings from last week. I trust Winnipeg to be able to duplicate that kind of performance more than I trust Toronto to be able to do it. I still don't believe the Argos are that team. And that team being the kind of team that can go into Winnipeg and beat a team like Winnipeg in front of their own fans. Especially considering they're probably going to get Andrew Harris back. They're probably going to get Darvin Adams back. They didn't have either of those players in week one. We're certainly going to be taking the Bombers here at home to beat the Argos. Again, back-to-back road games, tough for anybody. And again, there were so many game metrics in that game against Calgary that said Toronto should not have won. They did wind up winning, and that is important because results matter in this industry. But, like, I just don't think, like, there was enough going against Toronto that I I just don't see them doing it two weeks in a row. So we're going to be on the Bombers here for sure. Winnipeg is laying a full six points as favorites against the spread, and I'm going to lay those points too. Six points feels like a lot, considering that the underdogs were 4-0 against the spread last week. But if there's one team in this league that I'm super comfortable laying six points on after what I saw in week one, it's Winnipeg. So why not go for it? Total in this game set at 47 and a half. And even though this is the low total of the week, I'm actually going to stay under on it. The Bombers defense was ultra impressive against, again, really elite offensive talent in Hamilton. The Bombers defense was very impressive. And as predicted, this Argos defense is better. They added on this side of the ball. They're better on all levels. I'm going to stick to the under on this one. I don't expect a high scoring game. Let's go. Winnipeg 21, Toronto 14. So, I mean, that's only a mid 30. We're going to stick under 47 and a half points. And before we move on with the second half of our game picks for this week, I'm going to take the opportunity, as I always do, to shout out my great friends and my wonderful sponsors at Nerd Tees. Folks, go to nerdtees.ca, hit that promo code BWFINEST. That is going to save you 15% at checkout. You're going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks, and there's so much goodness to be found on nerdtees.ca, including this beautiful piece of, uh, piece of art work of art, piece of tea, work of tea, why not? I'm really good at this. Today's blend is an Amaretto Almond Biscotti. It's been a classic, a longtime favorite of mine since I first discovered Nerd Teas, low those many years ago, in simpler times when the world made sense. Grab a cup of Amaretto Almond Biscotti or any of dozens of great, incredible tea blends that you can find at nerdteas.ca. Hit that promo code once again, BWFINEST. Save your 15%. Get your free shipping in Canada. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdteas.ca. And it's with ad reads like that that I'm shocked she hasn't dropped me yet as a client. Anyway, Montreal and Edmonton is the third matchup that we are going to take a look at this week. Montreal, the road team, opening up their season, of course, after having the really unlucky week one bye. So in 2019, I'm just going to give Montreal the same kind of treatment I gave the teams last week. In 2019, the Alouettes were 10 and 8 to finish the season, 4 and 5 on the road, so a little under 500 there. They were even money against the West Division, which is obviously the team they're playing this week, even money at 5 and 5. Scored 479 points last year, but gave up 485. It was definitely the defense that let the Alouettes down in 2019. They were still the number two team in the East Division, but did fall to these Edmonton, well, they were the Edmonton Eskimos at the time, now the Edmonton Elks, fell to them in the East semifinal because Edmonton was the crossover team. What I like about the Alouettes, obviously a young breakout quarterback talent in Vernon Adams Jr., top-end offensive talent. I think Quan Bray is one of the best wide receivers in the CFL, and that also includes, obviously, an elite running back in William Stanbeck. A lot of value on him to lead the league in rushing. If this Alouettes team can run back a similar offensive performance that they saw in 2019, and if their new defensive coordinator, Baron Miles, sees an uptick in success, we can be talking about the Montreal Alouettes as a legitimate Grey Cup contender. But they got to fix that defense. 
The Elks opened up the season on the unhappy side of a 16 to 12 shocking loss against the Ottawa Red Blacks. And look, I don't mean to rag on the Red Blacks here, but like this team was what it was last not last year, in 2019. This was a bad football team two years ago. I don't think anybody but the most diehard Red Blacks fans thought Ottawa was going to go into Edmonton and beat them. Just distressing offensive inconsistency from the Edmonton Elks for that entire game, especially from Trevor Harris. We expect more from Trevor Harris through three picks in that game. As a matter of fact, the three interceptions that he threw is already a third of his total number of interceptions from 2019, which was nine, and he had not thrown three picks in a game. This is ironic. The last time he threw three interceptions in the same game, you gotta go all the way back to Grey Cup 106 as a member of the Ottawa Red Blacks. Total yards. 443 to 127. I put it on Twitter. Ottawa only had 90-some yards of net offense, and they won the game. It, it's baffling. It's inconceivable. Inconceivable. Time of possession, they dominated them, 36 to 24. Uh, rushing, 110 to 56. Uh, they sacked the quarterback five times, and they lost the game. I'm willing to call that Elks loss a glitch in the matrix, something that just absolutely was not supposed to happen. They were utterly dominant in that game, but it does sow the seeds of doubt about whether this Elks team, certainly offensively, is quite as good as maybe we gave it credit for. I'm still going to take Edmonton to win this game. Montreal is opening their season. We saw what happened to every other team opening the season last week. They all struggled offensively. The defense has played well, but they all struggled offensively with minor uh, minor peaks uh, of what might be eventually. This is Montreal's season opening game. I kind of expect some of the same from them. I kind of expect that curse, I guess, the opening season curse to kind of hit them. I've got to go with Edmonton here to win the game, but I'm not laying the points. Edmonton is a three and a half point favorite. I think this is a tight football game. I'm going to take the points with the Alouettes plus three and a half. This is not a great hedge, but it was going to be an underdog play for me probably one way or the other. I think these teams are close enough that it warrants it. And again, I'm certainly not buying that half point. Total in the game set at 49. It's the biggest total of the week. I'm going to go under on it because Edmonton just scored 12 points last week and Montreal's opening their season and we saw all the offenses struggle. So the fact that this is the highest number of the week, I don't particularly get it. So I'm going to stick with the under here. The weapons are there for both teams. But again, combining those two things, the Elk struggles and Montreal being in week one, got to take the under. I'm going to go Edmonton 21 to 20. And the last game we're going to look at this week is the Hamilton Tiger Cats traveling to Saskatchewan to take on the Riders. This is back-to-back -back road games for a Ticats team that dropped their game last week 19 to 6 in Winnipeg against the Bombers. Scoring on a fantastic, like a perfect opening drive. Masoli was like five for five or six for six on that opening drive. Beautiful touchdown throw to Jalen Acklin and then nothing else offensively. After Masoli threw that touchdown, he was 19 of 36, which is barely over 50%, threw for 158 yards, no touchdowns, two picks. That came after a perfect 5 for 5 and touchdown opening drive. But those are like Red Blacks 2019 numbers. Like those are not good numbers for a quarterback in this league. Instead, last week, the Ticats were served a piece of humble pie and a stark reminder that no one is owed anything in this league, no one is entitled to anything in this league, and you might be the best team, but when you play sloppy football, as in turning the ball over three times and not generating any yourself, it's not going to cut it, especially against a good team like Winnipeg, and they're playing another good team this week. The Riders were on the happy side of a 33-29 to win in Week 1. Not exactly the way they drew it up going on again, a 32-9 to drubbing in the first half, only to give up a 20-1 to run in the second half just to kind of hang on and lose, unfortunately, against the spread. But lightning start against, again, the unproven quarterback in Nathan Rourke. Cody Fajardo was surgical, though, in that game. 80% completion percentage. Still not spectacular other numbers. 230 yards passing, two touchdowns. He did throw a pick 
in that game, but to complete 80% of your passes, you're probably going to end up on the happy side of things. He did have six receivers that had at least three catches, so he spread the ball around very, very effectively, but none of those receivers had more than 70 yards. So no real breakout receiving performances. The Riders secondary did give up 397 passing yards against, but they stepped up with key plays when it counted, including the Nick Marshall pick six, which really, if you want to put it this way, was kind of the difference in the football game was putting those defensive points on the board. It's not unheard of, and especially with the difficulty of this early schedule, it's not going to shock me one little bit if the Ticats, the defending East champions, start off this season 0-2. I'm taking Saski to win this game. As we mentioned earlier, they are slight, slight, slight favorites, but look, the offense fell apart after that opening drive. I officially need to see it. I got to see it happen in order to think like, oh boy, there's nothing wrong with this. Especially seeing Brandon Banks on the sidelines. I don't know that this is necessarily the most cohesive team in this league. Now in saying that, maybe that's just a passionate player being passionate and maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. That's entirely possible. I get the feeling we'll see after this week. Obviously, where I like the Riders to win, they're a one and a half point favorite. It's a very small price to pay. I'm going to lay the point and a half on the team that I genuinely think is going to win the game, and that's the Riders. So Sasky minus a point and a half. Total in the game set at 48. I think this is a pretty good total. This is going to be right around what this ends on, but I'm going to stick under on it. I think it's reasonable to expect more offensive consistency from both of these teams. We're going to go under 48. Let's take Riders 24, Ticats 21. There you go, folks. Those are my picks for week two in the CFL 2021 CFL season. Let's go over them here with you one more time. I've got Calgary beating the BC Lions. That game is in Calgary, but I'm going to take the Lions with the points plus six and a half in a game that goes over the 48 and a half point total. I like Winnipeg to beat Toronto in Winnipeg, and I'm laying six points on the hometown Bombers in that game, a game that stays under 47 and a half points. I've got Edmonton beating Montreal in Edmonton, but I'm taking the points with the Alouettes plus three and a half in what I expect to be a very close football game that stays under 49 points. And in the final game of the week, I've got the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at home beating Hamilton. I'm laying a single point and a half on Saskatchewan at home in a game that stays under 48 points. Now to cap off the video, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an update on some of those futures bets that I had talked about earlier. Once again, at the end of next week, keep an eye on my Twitter account for a nine unit uh, futures card on the CFL. Again, nine teams, nine units. We're going to put that nine unit futures card on my Twitter account at blockbuster underscore guy that is going to be after next week's games. We've had movements in terms of futures odds on most outstanding player, most outstanding Canadian, and the 2021 Grey Cup odds. Most outstanding player, Bo Levi Mitchell and Cody Fajardo now both at the top of this at plus 300 apiece. That is plus 100 difference on Cody Fajardo from last week. Brandon Banks now new on this board. Uh, now tied with Willie Jefferson at plus 400. You can also grab Henek Muamba, who is plus 500. He's new on the board from last week. Obviously, all bets in this category do have some action. A couple of other bets that I find kind of interesting. Vernon Adams now on the board at plus 1,000 for most outstanding player. And Brian Burnham, receiver for the BC Lions, after a 7-catch, 92 yards, and a touchdown line in Week 1, has gone to plus 1,600. In terms of most outstanding Canadian, it stayed the same. It's been Henok Muamba, Cameron Judge, and Andrew Harris. A little bit of change on the odds where Muamba was plus 150, he's now plus 175. Where Judge was plus 175, he's now plus 200. And where Andrew Harris was plus 220, he's now plus 225. So all of those got a little bit better in terms of the payouts. And again, all bets have action. Everybody else is plus 800 or higher. Interesting option, possibly Kwaku Boteng, now plus 800 as well, after two sacks defensively in week one. 
Now, we had plenty of movement in the 2021 Grey Cup odds, and I'll be perfectly honest, this is where most of my nine units are going to be going. Hamilton and Saskatchewan, still the top two teams in terms of the Grey Cup odds. Hamilton moves to plus 366 from plus 296 last week after their week one loss. So a lot more value now on Hamilton, and they're still the odds-on favorite to win the Grey Cup. The real value is on Calgary. In what I think is an overreaction to their loss last week, they went from plus 496 to plus 642. A lot larger payout if you want to grab the Calgary Stampeders right now as a futures bet to win the Grey Cup. If it pays off, your odds are significantly better. Again, this is why I like to wait a few weeks. I like to let Vegas overreact to stuff like that. Edmonton's odds based on their loss went from plus 800 to plus 1,000. And the BC Lions, the big losers, going from plus 900 to plus 1,200. There you have it, folks. The week two episode is now in the books. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for the support on the week one episode. Thank you once again to my friend Morgan for the pictures from Edmonton. Edmonton from the game in week one and by the way 2009 was the answer for when the last time Calgary lost two straight games to open a season it's been a while not an eternity but it's been a minute that's it for me Justin Bridgewater's finest on YouTube blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter fueled as always by the incredible folks at nerd tees I'm now going to douse myself in the rest of this tea and get to editing this bad boy to get it up on time thank you so much for watching enjoy the games in week two we'll see you again in week number three cfl's back baby gotta love it